This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Githui Yort. It's Wednesday, September 16th. This is Africa 54. Due to the global outbreak of COVID-19, Voice of America is taking every necessary precaution to safeguard its employees. So our broadcasts will look a little different today and in the near future, as we, out of an abundance of caution, reduce our staffing at VU headquarters here in Washington. We're working to help keep you informed about what's going on, and we appreciate you staying with us on Africa 54. 24 migrants and refugees are believed to have drowned after their boat capsized trying to cross the Mediterranean Sea from Libya to Europe, according to the United Nations International Organization for Migration. Three boats were thought to have departed from Libya's Zawiya on Sunday night. The Libyan Coast Guard found 45 people on board two boats and brought them back, but the third had capsized. Hundreds die each year on the Mediterranean voyage, and last month, 45 Africans died off the Libyan coast in the biggest shipwreck this year. 52 inmates at a prison in the northeastern Congo city of Bunya have starved to death this year because of insufficient government funding, according to the United Nations and local authorities. The UN says the Democratic Republic of Congo's jails are among the world's most overcrowded with inmates living in squalid conditions on meager rations. The Bunya prison operates at nearly 500% capacity. President Felix Shisekedi told his cabinet this month he would personally ensure prisons across the country did not run out of food or medicine. Malnutrition is common in Congolese jails because food portions are allotted based on facilities' nominal capacity rather than their actual populations, according to New York-based Human Rights Watch. Nigerians are protesting a hike in electricity and fuel costs while marred in the economic hardships of the COVID-19 pandemic, but authorities maintain the new rates are in the best interests of Nigerians. Timothy Obiezu reports from Abuja. Protesters chanting on the streets that lead to Nigeria's Electricity Regulatory Commission in Abuja. The protesters are demanding an immediate reversal of a government increase in electricity and fuel costs. The government nearly doubled the cost of electricity this month and soon afterward removed the fuel subsidy, causing a spike in gasoline prices. It is anti-human, it is undemocratic, it is anti-people, and it's only aimed at subjecting the Nigerian people to more severe hardship. Not at this point in time, where we're just recovering from the, from the pandemic, where livelihoods are lost, jobs are lost, businesses are grounded. How do you survive? Most businesses here depend on energy from electricity or petrol to run. And because of the pandemic, they are either shut down or not operating at optimum capacities. Amina, who runs this bottled water company on the outskirts of Abuja, says the increase will affect production costs and her profit margin. All the capital we inject, it will go back to diesel and petrol. So there's no any profit. Because normally we, call the, the, we have to transport the pure water. The bottled water is transportation. So we use diesel, we use petrol. And we use petrol and diesel to, to, power, the generator, uh, to power our generator to produce. Many Nigerians accuse authorities of being insensitive to the hardships caused by the coronavirus pandemic. But authorities say the rise in power costs and removal of fuel subsidies will strengthen Nigeria's energy sector and ensure longer hours of power. They say it will also make fuel available in Nigeria all year round despite market fluctuations. 
energy expert Odion Amonfaman supports the government's decision because COVID-19 has wrecked the country's revenue sources. Crude oil prices, our main earner, has been quite low. So the Nigerian government is simply struggling for revenues to balance its budget and therefore cannot afford uh, subsidies on PMS. So it's a step in the right direction, uh, in my view. Uh, it's, 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 it's unfortunately a necessary pain that we have to take. Nigeria has spent a total of $22 billion in the last decade on fuel subsidies. Authorities also generate electricity at much higher cost than is distributed to consumers. Experts say the subsidy funds could be used for battling the coronavirus pandemic. But protesters here will remain resolute until something is done. Timothy Obiezu for VOA News, Abuja. It appears leaders of the economic community of West African states are compromising on their demand for a 12-month transitional period in Mali. Sources close to Tuesday's mini-summit in Accra between ECOWAS leaders and the National Committee for the Salvation of the People of Mali says the ECOWAS leaders expressed their willingness to allow a transitional period of between 12 to 18 months. However, the regional leaders are unwavering in their demand for a civilian leadership of the transitional process. Naolu Akande, spokesperson for Nigerian Vice President Yemi Osinbajo, says the ECOWAS leaders say they will lift sanctions on Mali only after the military junta names the transitional president and prime minister. The party of former Ivory Coast President Laurent Gbagbo says it will continue to demand changes to the country's constitutional court particularly replacement of the court's president. Jean Gervais Chedi is vice president for finance and budget of the Ivorian Popular Front Party. He says the court's president is a member of President Alassane Ouattara's political party. Chedi also says the party will fight for a new electoral commission. This came after the Constitutional Court Monday declared President Ouattara eligible to run for a third term in the coming October 31 presidential election. The court, however, rejected the candidacies of Babo and former leader, Jium Soro. Chedi says the court's decision is a constitutional coup. Fires burning in California are the largest on record. In Washington state, a larger area burned in five days than have burned in any previous year on record except one. And in Oregon, one-tenth of the state's population was under fire, evacuation warnings, or orders last week. Scientists say climate change is making fires worse in the American West. VOA Steve Baragona has more. As record-breaking fires burn across the western United States, President Donald Trump remains skeptical that climate change is a factor. Here he is Monday at a meeting with California officials. It'll start getting cooler. I you wish just, you just watch. I wish science agreed with you. <laughs> hey, well, I don't think science knows, actually. Yet science has been sounding the alarm about climate change for a long time, says University of California Merced wildfire expert Leroy Westerling. We've been doing modeling and simulation for years now that indicates that these really severe widespread fire seasons um, are coming. And we're seeing that emerge in real time. Wildfires need dry plants to burn, and climate change is increasing the supply, he says. Studies show the West has warmed over the last century, and warmer air dries things faster. That means even a normal year would be drier. But these have not been normal years, he says. We had a drought for five years earlier in the 21st century here uh, that was unprecedented in probably the last to 1,200 years at least. And warmer weather is melting the West's water reserves in the mountains. The region relies on winter snow accumulation to provide long-lasting water supplies, says wildfire expert Jessica Holofsky with the U.S. Forest Service. We're seeing more precipitation falling as rain rather than snow. The snowpack isn't lasting as long with the higher temperatures, so it's running off earlier in the season. Leaving less water when the dry summer months arrive. And warmer, drier conditions have helped tree-killing beetles multiply. 
All this has left roughly 150 million dead, flammable trees standing in California's forests alone. But Holovsky says humans share the blame for the fires. Smaller fires used to happen naturally, which thinned out the forests. We have suppressed fire very effectively since World War II. That means there are more fuels now than there used to be. And so when fires do occur, there's more fuel to burn and they're more severe. Plus, more people are living in areas that are prone to burn. So when fires do break out, they're more destructive and more costly. Conditions will get worse as the planet continues to warm, Holofsky says. There's going to be more fire. You know, a kind of ballpark is maybe two to three times the annual area burned uh, in the future. Scientists say this year's record-breaking fire season is just a taste of what's to come. Steve Barragona, VOA News. We would like to hear what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Still to come, a Nigerian technology entrepreneur who specializes in cyber security wants to stop cyber crime and cyber enabled crimes in the West African country. We'll be right back. Hello, I'm Linor Moudou, your VOA health correspondent. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the World Health Organization says the best way to reduce your chances of being infected or spreading coronavirus is to wear a mask to avoid breathing any small liquid droplets which may contain the virus. Regularly wash your hands with soap and water or clean your hands with an alcohol-based hand sanitizer. For more information on COVID-19, visit who.int or contact your local or national health authorities. Welcome back to Africa 54. Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden traveled to Florida on Tuesday to court the Latino vote in this crucial battleground state. VOA's Brian Pardon reports nationwide Latino voters still favor Biden over Trump, but recent polls show Biden's advantage eroding and Trump now holds a slight lead among Latinos in Florida. 
due in part to the president's hardline policies toward Cuba and Venezuela. Democratic presidential candidate Joe Biden came to Central Florida on Tuesday to ask the growing Puerto Rican population for their vote and support. More than any other time, the Hispanic community, Latino community holds in their palm of the hand, their hand, the destiny of this country. For nearly a century now, no Republican candidate has won the presidency without winning Florida, where Latinos make up nearly 25 percent of the electorate. In the 2016 election, Trump won this pivotal state by just 1.2 percent, even though then-Democratic candidate Hillary Clinton won the Latino vote. Florida polls this year showed Trump and Biden in a virtual tie, but this time it's Trump who has the edge with Latino voters. Nationally, surveys show Biden's advantage over Trump with Latinos has dropped from 30 percent to 9 percent. The president who met with Latino supporters in Nevada on Monday interpreted the polls as a clear victory for his campaign. This is good. You know, uh, this is what the polls are all saying, too. You know, as a Republican, Republicans don't do as well as perhaps they should, and probably some shouldn't do very well. But the polls came out, and we're leading uh, Sleepy Joe by a lot. In appealing to Latinos, Biden has criticized Trump's restrictionist immigration policies and called for increased wages and assistance for Hispanic laborers, especially for those who work in essential services during the coronavirus pandemic. We depend on them. And a lot of people who are recognized for the first time by what they truly are, essential. What we do, we don't just need to thank them. We need to pay them. The president's Latino support in Florida comes in large part from Cuban Americans in Miami who favored Trump's curtailing of former President Barack Obama's engagement towards communist Cuba and pressure from the Trump White House to force Venezuelan socialist leader Nicolas Maduro from power. Trump's attacks on Biden as a socialist have also reportedly resonated with older Cubans who fled the island after the 1959 revolution. Meanwhile, progressive activists are urging Biden to reach out to younger Latinos who are more focused on domestic issues like economic and racial inequality. There's a lot of new Latino young people, young Cubans who've come of age who are registering to vote who are way more progressive than their fathers or their grandmothers. With less than two months till the election, the Biden campaign is putting new emphasis on winning back Latinos in Florida. Last week, Democratic vice presidential candidate Kamala Harris visited a Venezuelan community in Florida, and former Democratic primary rival Michael Bloomberg pledged to spend $100 million in Florida to boost support for Biden in the state, including with Latino voters. Brian Patton, VOA News, Washington. U.S. President Donald Trump hosted the signing of the Abraham Accords at the White House Tuesday, a deal that normalizes Israel's relations with the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain. Experts say the accords signify a shift away from the decades-long regional strategy that in exchange for diplomatic recognition, Israel must provide concessions to the two-state solution towards an independent Palestinian state. White House correspondent Patsy Widakuswara has this report. President Donald Trump said he is marking the dawn of a new Middle East as foreign ministers from the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain join Israel's prime minister at the White House Tuesday to sign the Abraham Accords, normalizing the two Gulf Arab states with Israel. In Israel's entire history, there have previously been only two such agreements. Now we have achieved two in a single month, and there are more to follow. The White House says the accords are named after Abraham, the patriarchal figure in Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, who is seen as representing the potential for unity among the three faiths. The agreements are part of a broader diplomatic effort by the Trump administration to pressure Palestinians into accepting a peace deal, a strategy that experts call the outside-in approach. And that is, if everybody recognizes Israel, in its current borders, um, in its de facto control over all of Jerusalem, over the West Bank, uh, and even the Gaza Strip, um, that that would eventually force Palestinians essentially to acquiesce uh, and um, leave them no choice, really, but uh, to surrender to this reality on the ground. 
You could say it's a back door, but I call it a smart door, not a back door. In the West Bank Tuesday, people took to the streets to protest the deal, with Palestinian Prime Minister Mohammad Satayeh condemning the accords, calling it a black day in the history of Arab nations. Historically, Palestinians have relied on Arab states withholding recognition of Israel as a bargaining chip in their struggle towards statehood. Analysts say the agreement between the UAE, Bahrain and Israel reflect a changing regional calculation on the two-state solution. This is really a consolidation of some of the geopolitical shifts that we've been seeing that have been coming for decades, but that show that Arab uh, Gulf states and Israel have more in common um, in terms of their opposition to Iran than they have in opposition in relation to the, the, uh, their, their, their views on Palestinian aspirations for statehood. Less than two months before the U.S. election, the Trump administration is touting the Abraham Accords as a foreign policy win. And while foreign policy may not rank as high of an election issue compared to the pandemic and the economy, the future of Israel matters to a key group of Trump supporters, evangelical Christians, who Pew Data reports made up about a third of the president's supporters during the 2016 race. Patsy Widahuswara, VOA News. In our tech report, cybercrime and cyber-enabled crime are among the fastest growing global security threats, according to the FBI. Cybercrime has increased by some 400%. In Nigeria, several internet-assisted crimes are committed daily in various forms, such as fraudulent electronic mails, pornography, identity theft, hacking, cyber harassment, spamming, piracy, and phishing, but Adedoyin Adedeji, a technology entrepreneur who specializes in cybersecurity, wants to change that narrative. Africa 54 technology reporter Paul Ndiho spoke to Adedeji, who is based in Lagos. Adedoyin Adedeji, welcome to Africa 54. Oh, thank you very much, sir. As a technology entrepreneur uh, in Lagos, uh, Nigeria, what is it uh, that uh, you do to empower young people? So over the years, what we've tried to do is to help young people see how to leverage technology and to promote um, 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 like capacity building when it comes to technology. So uh, technology gives us that, gives you that, what I call that superpower for you to reach out to the world and let the world see you differently. Uh, what kind of uh, skills that you give uh, to these uh, young people? So one of the things we do across the country is to also do um, internet safety training internet um, training for a lot of young people across the country. And this is something we've done um, for ourselves. I mean, we've done by ourselves. We've also done in partnership with a number of other organizations. Uh, when it comes to the internet, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, hackers out there. There are a lot of uh, 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 unsecure places on the internet. So how do yeah. you uh, advise young people? How do you make sure that uh, people who uh, get trained to be uh, tech uh, experts I don't end up uh, doing the wrong things on the internet. The first thing is um, let people see the opportunities that are available on the internet. Um, we also have a crisis of uh, cyber crime in the country, which is something we can't shy away from. We have to talk about it. There is a crisis of cyber crime in the country, and um, at some points, people we had this this um, mindset general. There's a general mindset that oh. A lot of the cyber crime is probably Nigerians that are trying to dupe or they are trying to cheat people abroad, steal people's money abroad. But increasingly, we are seeing a reverse in trend, meaning that um, some of these some of these cyber criminals are coming home now. Let me put it that way. Increasingly, we are having people's bank accounts being wiped out. We are having all that. So one of the things we try to do is um, in some of our trainings, we bring in forensic uh, detectives from EFCC, that's the Economic uh, Financial Crimes Commission which is the um, organization that is largely in charge of cybercrime, combating cybercrime in Nigeria. We bring some of the detectives in to some of our programs to talk to some of these young people. And um, interestingly, one thing we've, we've um, learned over the years is that some of these kids do not know that cybercrime is actually a crime. That was the strange thing. Most of the time, they consider it as an also, let me put it that way, that it's just an also with your online, uh, you could, uh, these people have money, you could just take some of their money, it's not a big deal. It's, it's, they don't see it as 
um, they don't see it as um, like or robbing people, let me put it that way. So one of the things we try to do is we bring in these detectives to tell them real stories of people they've caught. Sometimes they even present pictures of some of the assets they've seized from these people. Uh, you just brought up a very good uh, point. Uh, as much as uh, Nigeria is known as uh, uh, the next uh, Silicon Valley, especially Lagos, uh, you also have a lot of uh, challenges when it comes to cybercrime. Uh, most of the cybercrime that I've read about uh, comes from that part of the world. We've worked with various partners over the years. We've worked with the American consulates. We worked with the likes of Facebook on this. We worked with um, the likes of Google on this. So over the years, we've done all this, and um, we'll continue to do it. What makes Lagos attractive for young people who are tech savvy to want to engage in some of these uh, crimes? Okay. Um, well, like Lagos is the economic capital of Nigeria, number one, and uh, secondly, it's um, it's where you get the exposure, really. We also need to also look at the area of um, internet access. Lagos um, across the country has some of the best internet facilities across the country. But even the cyber crime, crime, criminal guys also, they are also aware that you get the best connection in Lagos. So, um, well, majorly it's just because Lagos is the most populated and probably the most um, economically viable place in Nigeria. Have you had any success uh, trying to push uh, this message uh of uh, young people not engaging in a, a cyber crime. We've had a lot of success, and uh, we are building on that success. Our ability to partner with government on this, um, working with um, governments to take these things to public schools, that's government schools, because that's where the vulnerability really is. So one of the things we try to do is to partner with governments and let governments see the consequences of not um, taking this message to their students. So thank you so much for your time. No, no problem, sir. Yeah. No pro that was Africa 54 tech reporter Paul Ndiho speaking to Adedoyin Adedeji in Lagos, Nigeria. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com from all of us here in Washington. Thank you for watching. is about more than just sitting here and talking about women's issues. It's about listening to them and bringing their opinions to the table and making sure their voices are heard. Because our lived experiences, our stories, and our voices will help shape the next generation.